What's up everybody? I'd like to welcome everyone to my second edition of my triple movie review for the filmmaker Lars von Trier. I just decided why not let's just go ahead and pump this review out because believe it or not this is probably my most highly requested video from my channel because my first triple movie review that I did for Melancholia, Antichrist, and Dogville that one was pretty well received from you guys and I was actually honestly pretty excited to do this review because from everybody who saw my first triple movie review for Lars von Trier and my House at Jack Built review, y'all know that I pretty much have dug everything that the guy has done so far. So with that being said, I'm not going to keep blabbering on too much. I'm just going to get right into it. The first film I'm going to be reviewing is Breaking the Waves. Obviously, it's here in the background. Uh, Breaking the Waves is obviously written and directed by Lars von Trier, and it stars Emily Watson and Stellan Skarsgård, who... Stella Skarsgård is pretty much almost in every Von Trier film that I've seen at this point. So huge kudos to him for, you know, having a, obviously a bunch of appreciation for Von Trier. Breaking the Waves was a film that my cousin Eric has been really wanting me to watch for a long time. And um, it's one of those films that the more I anticipated it, the more excited I got to watch it. Because I got to watch all of his previous films, like I mentioned, Dogville, Antichrist, Melancholia. And I just heard that Breaking the Waves is some of people's favorite out of his filmography. So going into this film, I was pretty pumped for, for what I was about to see. And I really enjoyed this film. Um, I honestly really, really think most of this film is incredibly well executed. Um, in terms of its aesthetics, in terms of, this, of the cinematography, the cinematography is very Von Trier. Um, a lot of close-up shots, but there's also some really stunning landscape shots in this. It has that raw, grainy feel, but at the same time, at moments, has very stunning and beautiful imagery. And, you know, apart from the aesthetics, the acting performance from the lead actress, Emily Watson, in this film was absolutely breathtaking. I mean, it might be one of my favorite female lead performances of his so far, because it was just so incredibly believable every frame of this just felt incredibly believable in terms of her character performance because there wasn't a single moment in this film that i felt um like i felt she was forcing the character like at first you're trying you're kind of wondering what kind of what's wrong with the character and why she's acting a certain way but as the film develops you do realize um why she is acting this way and what her issues are and understanding that religious consequences and oppressive cultural consequences can also exacerbate her mental condition that she's going through throughout this entire film. And I was really impressed with those thematic elements that were driving her character. And also, again, just her performance overall was very stunning and incredibly believable. And if it wasn't for her incredible performance really driving this film, I don't think it would have been as fulfilling or as satisfying by the end of it. Stellan Skarsgård also does a brilliant job in this film, even though, I'm not going to spoil it, but he gets put in a, in a situation and in a position to where, you know, he's not really doing a lot of body movements. But even with those scenes, it was incredibly impressive because I felt his pain and I felt his strain throughout all of those segments, and I thought it, those scenes were very well conveyed on his part. And again, huge props to the writer and director Lars von Trier for getting these kinds of performances out of his actors. Because most of his films, I'm usually really impressed with the performances. Only with the children in his movies, I always seem to have an issue with his children performances in his films. And in Breaking the Waves, there is a moment that involves kids. And it is actually kind of an odd moment for the film because it just feels rather theatrical it doesn't feel like a genuine real moment it feels like these kids are there just to kind of make a character and thematic point for the film and it just didn't really feel natural and even their acting is you know it, their acting could have been directed better or they at least could have been done better but overall the performances in this film are incredibly impressive and I think Von Trier does a great job at getting these kinds of performances out of his actors. And it's kind of funny because throughout this entire film, it reminded me a lot of the same kind of approach that he did with Dancer in the Dark, which is a film that I'm going to be talking about next, so don't worry. It kind of reminded me of Dancer in the Dark in the sense that it involves a female lead character that eventually starts going through some serious turmoil and her life starts to get devastated in certain ways one after the other. 
But by the end of the film, like the very ending of this film, reminded me of the house that Jack built in a way, in the sense that Von Trier just decided to do something just so out there and just hope that maybe some audience members are on board with it. Except that I feel that the house that Jack built did it a hundred times better. Because guys, I really enjoyed Breaking the Waves a lot, but the very ending to this film really bothered me. Like, I almost kind of hate the ending a bit, and that's really disappointing. It's disappointing because, you know, this is quite a long film. This is, I believe, two hours and 40 minutes, something like that. But, you know, you, you invest that much time into this film, and then when this film decides to execute its ending that way, I don't know, it just kind of feels like the film is kind of taking a big dump on you and kind of takes away from some of the ambiguity that was presented throughout this film. And um, I'm going to go and talk about it really quick because I feel like I have to kind of discuss it for a second. So if you don't want the ending spoiled for you, if you haven't seen it yet, here's your warning. The ending of this film is after Stellan Skarsgård throws uh, the casket with uh, her wife's body in it and he throws it into the ocean. Afterwards, his team is, you know, they wake up in the middle of the night and they're like, hey man, let's go outside, man. You're not going to believe this shit. Let's go outside. So they go outside and before they go outside, he tells, you know, one of his workers is pointing out that in the radar, there's like nothing anywhere, right? So the radar is not picking up anything. So when they actually go out there, they, it's basically they walk into this giant divine like supernatural revelation that's occurring and you can see these giant uh church bells ringing from the top of the clouds so it's kind of this big grand like supernatural religious ending that you could read into i guess a few ways you could you could you could interpret it as emily watts's character just showing a divine revelation to her husband and showing that she's that she appreciates everything that occurred or it could show you that Emily Watson's character actually ends up going to heaven, even though the church condemned her to hell. And, you know, it's fine. I, I can understand that you could read into this thematically and metaphorically. But my issue with it is that he incorporated it as a clear part of the narrative, and it wasn't subtle at all. And again, it kind of erases that kind of faithful ambiguity that occurs throughout the entire film about whether or not uh, you know, she's talking to God or she's not talking to God. Because if it was up to me, I honestly would have ended the film right when Stellan Skarsgård's character throws the casket into the ocean and you can hear the casket break the waves. And as it fades to black, I would have just ended it right there. Because it just seems like that would have been much more appropriate and much more fitting for the film's content. But instead, it decided to go more with it and kind of give you this ham-fisted ending that really turned me off and it sucks because I only have very minor issues with the film besides that. The ending is one big issue that is really hard for me to get over because it just really bothered me that much. But that being said, I still really enjoyed this film a lot. There is so much about this film to really appreciate and analyze and really dive into in terms of character, theme, and just enjoy because the aesthetic quality of this film is top-notch for me too. I mean it has that Von Trier editing style to where like every second it's cutting even within the same scene and same frame you still get those kind of weird jarring cuts that it's hard to get used to when you first start watching Von Trier's film but you know after a while it just becomes second nature like you don't even really notice it too much because that's just how he decides to edit and film his shit but you know it still has that aesthetic value and it still has that thematic value and filled with brilliant performances on top of that so you know, I still think this is a pretty damn good film overall. So I'm going to give Breaking the Waves an 8 out of 10. It sucks because I honestly probably would have given it a 9 out of 10, but that ending just really turned me off and I had to dock it a whole point because it just really disappointed me. All right, so the next film I'm going to be talking about is Dancer in the Dark, starring Bjork, the famous Icelandic singer. So Dancer in the Dark is probably one of my most requested films to review, period. Like, I, I've, I think I've gotten more requests for Dancer in the Dark than any other film that I can even remember. So I'm actually pretty excited to finally give you guys my thoughts on this film because I know a lot of you have been dying to hear what I think about it. And 
I really enjoy this film a lot. Um, I think there's so much to really appreciate about it. I believe that Dancer in the Dark was my first Von Trier film. Um, I don't think I watched any of his films before that. And so that being said, when I first watched it, I definitely enjoyed it and I liked it, but I wasn't too huge on it. Like there was just some things about it that really bugged me. Remember, this was my first time, so I'm trying to get used to the editing style and some of the aesthetic choices are kind of bugging me. And the whole musical element of this film, some of those segments bugged me when I watched it the first time. And on my second viewing, I will honestly say that a lot of those things don't bug me as much, but they still bug me a little bit. So I think I like it. I think I liked it better the second time, but I don't think that I'm still... I still don't think that I am in love with this film as I think some people are. I still really enjoy this film and I do think it's a great film. Like in terms of musicals, I think it does an excellent job at subverting the thematic and overall tone of what musicals traditionally are. Because, you know, in traditional musicals, most of the narrative and the themes are very upbeat and very whimsical. and the upbeat, whimsical nature of Dancer in the Dark only serves as kind of like a fantasy coping mechanism for the main character. And I thought that was a really interesting approach to this film that, again, kind of really kept me engaged and wanted to see how far it took me. And thanks to Bjork's talent and her, and her performance in this film, which was, by the way, absolutely breathtaking, um, it really works for the most part. It really does work. She really sells this character, who, by the way, is a blind character. It's not the easiest trying to play a blind character. Well, I'll take that back. She's not fully blind, but she's damn near blind. Still, very hard character to portray, and she does a damn good job at portraying this role. I've heard a lot of rumors about bad, uh, about a bad connection with Bjork and Von Trier on set. I've heard they kind of hated each other on set, and... You know, that's kind of understandable to me because they're both serious artists and they both probably had different visions of what they wanted to do. And when you have two serious artists, you know, they tend to clash and they kind of tend to hate each other because there's no real compromising going on. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure of the full context of what actually happened, but I can only, I can only assume that that was at least one of the factors that was going on. But either way, I still think that she gave an excellent performance. And I think Von Trier's direction in this film is pretty stunning, as it usually is. Um, this film, again, as I, as I mentioned with Breaking the Waves, it just hits a point where there's just so much turmoil for the character. And again, all she has is, you know, her love for music and dancing. So when those musical numbers come on, it's a little bit easier to not get taken out. Because my big issue with traditional musicals is that I always seem to get taken out of the film whenever the musical number starts. And with Dancer in the Dark, it happens to me still. There's still some moments where I get taken out, but it doesn't happen as often. And I feel like it's much easier to immerse myself into the musical numbers when I know that they are all in her head. But I'm not gonna lie, there are some moments in this film that are just like tonally somber and emotionally tragic. And sometimes when the musical number would come on right after it, it wouldn't really allow me to linger on with that very well executed feeling. And I kind of wish that maybe some of those numbers would either just not be there or just maybe give a little bit more time before it smooths into it. But most of the musical numbers don't really bother me. The only one that really, really bothers me is the one on the train tracks because that one I just feel is maybe a little too long and it doesn't really serve much of a purpose for the story and maybe only a little bit for the character like I just don't feel like it does much you know at least it doesn't do what's worthy enough for the character and for the narrative to justify it being there and it just even on the second viewing it still managed to annoy me a bit but the other musical numbers really grew on me. David Morris is also in this film as well. And I remember when I was watching it, I knew that I remembered him from when I watched Disturbia as a young teenager. And in this film, his character is just so irritating. Like, I don't think I've ever wanted to legitimately kill a character more than I wanted to kill this guy. But I loved his character's place in the narrative. I just felt like 
again, it just kind of tells you a lot about humanity and how much we're and how much how far we're willing to go to take advantage of somebody just to really help ourselves. But unlike Breaking the Waves, Dancer in the Dark pulls no punches with its ending. I mean, it is just straight up rooted to reality. The most unfair ending you could possibly imagine for this character happens and it really gets you. It really hits you to your core, especially Bjork's performance there at the end was just emotionally draining. It was breathtaking because you really bought every moment of her performance and again, tragic, but but very well done, very well directed. And I think that's why I, I appreciated this ending to this film more because I felt like it just felt more honest and I loved that about it because Von Trier is usually a very honest filmmaker and I feel like that really reflects with this film and the film's ending. But overall, I think Dancer in the Dark is a fantastic film. Bjork gives an astonishing performance in this film. I am really impressed by her. Um, Lars Von Trier's direction and writing in this film is also what you would expect a Von Trier film would be. The editing choices are still there. Um, again, very somber and honest film that really made me appreciate it a lot. And the musical numbers in this, at first, mostly annoyed me. Now, it doesn't annoy me as much. I feel like I'm much more immersed into them and can really appreciate them for what they're trying to do. So I'm going to give Dancer in the Dark an 8 out of 10. I mean, if I'm recommending musicals to somebody, Dancer in the Dark is going to be at the very top of that list because I want to expose people to the genre, but something that is a little bit more unconventional than what they're used to seeing and definitely subverts the tone in a lot of different ways. Most people that I know who aren't even huge into film know what Nymphomaniac is and some of them have actually seen it. So that's pretty cool. But one cool thing about Nymphomaniac is that it actually has a pretty huge cast. I mean, you have Charlotte Gainsbourg, who is obviously an Antichrist and Melancholia. Shia LaBeouf is in this as well, and he goes all the way with his role in terms of what he's willing to show on camera. Um, Stacey Martin is also in this, and she plays the young version of Charlotte Gainsbourg's character, uh, Young Joe. She was, she is a dedicated actress, like, holy shit. The amount of shit that she's willing to do in this film is quite staggering. And you gotta give her respect and praise for being willing to really go this far with this role. And, I don't know, I was just really impressed with her dedication and also just with her performance on top of that. Because not only is she willing to do a lot, but her acting performance is also really impressive and very engaging and believable throughout the film as well. Um, Stellan Skarsgård is in this, obviously. Like I said, he's almost in every fucking Von Trier film. Uh, he was, you know, as far as his performance goes, he was excellent. Pretty much everybody's performance in this film was really good. Uma Thurman is also in this. And by the way, the segment, the, her entire segment that she's in, because she's basically just in one big segment, that was an incredibly engaging and awkward segment. Uh, yeah, it was kind of hard to sit through because it gets so cringe, but very well portrayed and you can really feel the emotion dripping out of that scene just from her performance and of course from Von Cheer's direction that really helps scenes like that come to life. And, you know, overall, just my overall thoughts, volume one is a little different from volume two. But I actually ended, I think I ended up liking volume two just a little bit more because I feel like volume one, as much as I like it, I feel like there's a little bit, there's a bit too many segments in the first volume that just do way too much over explaining. Because volume one was, going to be honest, it was kind of frustrating to kind of get through sometimes because I feel like for more than half of it, there's a lot of metaphors and symbolisms and analogies that are getting thrown at you in the, in the, in the first volume that Stellan Skarsgård's character just verbally explains to you just way too much. I mean, there's even a segment in this film where, you know, Charlotte Gainsbourg's character is explaining her experience. And after he explain, after she explains her experience, Stellan Skarsgård's character is like, wait, stop, rewind it, go back. And then the film actually rewinds to her story. And then Stellan Skarsgård just goes and explains how the metaphor relates to that and how, and it pretty much overly explains his metaphorical comparison to her story. And it's just like, 
if you're gonna draw an analogy, like why do you have to go out of your way to verbally explain everything that you want to? Because it just seems like lazy. Like it just seems like you're just being way too preachy for no reason. And you could have conveyed a lot of those notions just through inferences and imagery. And unfortunately, the first the first volume I feel like has a lot of that over explanatory uh, dialogue. And it sucks because I really did enjoy most of those philosophical situations and philosophical moral dilemmas that the characters would bring up because that's almost basically the entire film. The entire film is kind of Charlotte Gainsbourg talking about her experiences because she thinks she's a shitty person and Stellan Skarsgård's character is basically just trying through every single philosophical argument that he can try to flip it back on her and explain to her that she's not a bad person and she's actually doing good things more than bad or at least doing neutral things that don't necessarily mean that you're bad. And I did enjoy that structure to the film because I found it very thought-provoking in terms of what it's saying about morality and what it turns about say people with mental illness and depression and I enjoyed that but I feel like if it only just cut back on hitting me over the head with what it means all the time then I would have enjoyed it a bit more. But it's not really a huge deal because Nymphomaniac Volume 1 and 2 together is basically five hours and more worth of material and it just has so much to throw at you and so much to offer you throughout its entire runtime. So there are still quite a bit of things that I really enjoyed about this film that um, definitely didn't the over-explanatory dialogue didn't drag the film down too bad for me. Because by the way, I watched the director's cut, which is the version that I think everybody should watch because I feel like it's just a more obviously a more honest depiction of what Von Trier was going for. But the director's cut just shows, I mean, it doesn't give a shit about what it shows. I mean, there is straight up penetration in this. I mean, this is, there's parts of this film that you have to consider pornography. I mean, there's just no way around it. I mean, when I say that's, but that is pornography, I don't mean that it's filmed in a way that's meant to sexually arouse you or anything like that. But it does film it straight up as if it was a porn. Like it doesn't care about showing penetration. It doesn't care about showing fellatio. It doesn't care about any of that. It's just going to show it straight up and you, and you just got to deal with it and bear with it. And you know, sometimes I felt like it wasn't necessary to show it, but I feel like that's just the film's shtick. Like that's the film style. Like you're going to be seeing a lot of real sex. And again, since, since, since I'm talking about that, you have to give more praise to these actors because the real sex in this movie is just quite staggering, especially with how much there is of it because there is quite a bit of it. Um, they don't linger though. Like the sex scenes in this, they don't really linger for very long. It's kind of just flashes of graphic sex and all of it pretty much has its own context and purpose for the film, whether it's for a thematic purpose, uh, for a character purpose, or just for a narrative purpose. All of it didn't feel shoehorned. It didn't feel like he w it was just there for the sake of trying to add something shocking for no reason. Like it all felt like it was there to convey something purposeful. And that was one thing that I did appreciate about how he decided to film sexuality. But it's still a lot to take in though. I mean, there's this BDSM segment and even that like is pretty hard to watch because it just... The way that it's filmed and the way that it's directed, I mean, it's incredibly realistic. Everything in this film feels absolutely genuine. It doesn't feel like you're watching something that's make-believe. And I think that's why the content is kind of hard to get through for some people because it doesn't feel like it's fake. It feels like you're actually watching these events unfold. And that's, again, huge props to Von Trier for really trying to make this feel real. But again, I think one thing that I just really appreciated the most out of this film was its concentration of philosophical moral dilemmas and how one thing that can clearly on face value seem obviously immoral if you just think about it maybe for a little bit longer and hear the moral position that someone has to offer you know maybe you could think about it in a different way and see that it's not so black and white as it seems i mean this film even goes as far von trier i swear to god it even goes as far to try to justify giving oral sex to a pedophile. That's where Von Trier's at in this film sometimes, but it's not even something that's abnormal to philosophy. Like I've I have a minor in philosophy, and throughout all the throughout all the philosophy classes that I've attended, 
we have talked about that kind of level of shit in terms of trying to figure out what's really moral and what's not. And I think that, again, this film, at least for me, one of the most thought-provoking and interesting aspects of this film is how throughout the entire thing it is discussing these philosophical moral dilemmas that I found just to be, you know, really thought-provoking. And But that, that being said, you know, I really don't think that anybody is going to really enjoy this film besides, you know, maybe like young edgy teenagers who just want to watch something crazy and film lovers. That's about it. I mean, I don't think anybody else, I can't see a casual watching this and really sticking with it because I just think it's too much for them to handle. It's just, it's really graphic and I can see them seeing some of this as just excessive and meaningless and just tapping out. But I think that if you're a film lover or, you know, if you just want to watch something that's shocking, this, I mean, it'll, it'll deliver on those fronts. I think there's plenty uh, to like when it comes to those aspects. But for me personally, I really enjoyed um, how deep the philosophy was trying to go throughout this entire film. The only time where it just pissed me off was how it was just too over-explanatory with its metaphors when it came to in comparison to Charlotte Gainsbourg's stories. I just felt like that was just way too much. It didn't need to be there. Von Trier needs to just reel it in a little bit because that was just... It's just too much, man. And also the ending to this film. It's just, I mean, you can kind of see it coming, but it's still like, why? Like Von Trier, you just, I mean, I like the ending. I actually really like the ending, but it's just like, God, why does humanity have to fucking suck so bad? So I'm going to give Nymphomaniac volume one and two an eight out of 10. Well, apparently all three of these films are going to get an 8 out of 10 for me. I didn't plan that, I swear. It is just what it is. I'm not sure if I really like any of these films more than the previous three that I reviewed, but really only time will tell. Maybe one or two of these will grow on me and I'll like better. But nevertheless, I still really enjoyed all three of these films, and I still have yet to watch a Von Trier film that I think is just mediocre. Because I think he has at least three more uh, lesser known films that I haven't seen yet. So I'm gonna do another one. Don't know when. Maybe it'll be another four or five months for you to do that. I don't know. Who knows? Depends on how good this one does. We'll see. But either way, so far, I have really enjoyed Von Trier's work. Um, I think he has a lot to offer when it comes to filmmaking. And, you know, I hope more people come around to this guy because I think that um, he's more than just this shocking try hard director. I think he has a lot of thematic and thought provoking material. Uh, conveyed in his film. Well, anyway, thank you so much for hearing what I had to say about Dancer in the Dark, Breaking the Waves, and Nymphomaniac. If you really enjoyed what I had to say about these Von Trier films, please make sure to give this video a like and share it amongst your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel to be updated on more film-related content. Mm -hmm.